43. Psalm 143, this is God's word. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul, he hath smitten my life down to the ground. He hath made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake. For thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, cut off mine enemies, and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. Now turn to Lord's Day 23, a summary of that portion of Scripture and many others. <clears throat> Lord's Day 23. But what doth it profit thee now that thou believest all this? That I am righteous in Christ before God and an heir of eternal life. How art thou righteous before God? Only by a true faith in Jesus Christ. So that, though my conscience accuse me that I have grossly transgressed all the commandments of God and kept none of them, and am still inclined to all evil, notwithstanding God, without any merit of mine, but only of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, even so as if I never had had nor committed any sin, yea, as if I had fully accomplished all that obedience which Christ has accomplished for me, inasmuch as I embrace such benefit with a believing heart. Why sayest thou that thou art righteous by faith only? Not that I am acceptable to God on account of the worthiness of my faith, but because only the satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ is my righteousness before God, and that I cannot receive and apply the same to myself any other way than by faith only. Beloved, in our Lord Jesus Christ, let's get the Heidelberg Catechism 
roadmap in front of us. Three sections on this map. The first one being how great my sins and miseries are. The second part being how I'm delivered from my sins and miseries in Jesus Christ. And then the third big part of the map is how I am thankful for my deliverance from sin and misery in Christ. We are currently and we continue traveling in that second part of the map how I am delivered from my sins and miseries in Jesus Christ. But inside this second section, on this part of the map, there are different parts. We've been going through the Apostles' Creed for the last number of weeks. With Lord's Day 22, last time, we have concluded our treatment of those different parts of the Apostles' Creed. Now with Lord's Day 23, we're no longer in that Apostles' Creed anymore. But, as I said, we do continue in the second section of the Catechism. Now there's a transition here. After we've concluded the Apostles' Creed, question 59 asks, But what doth it profit thee now that thou believest all this? What's it talking about? You believe all this. Well, it's referring simply to the articles of the Apostles' Creed that we've been going through in the last few weeks. And now it's saying, what does it profit thee that thou believe all those articles of the Apostles' Creed, those truths of scriptures? You believe them by faith? Now, what's the profit of all of that? It's this that I am righteous in Christ before God and an heir of eternal life. It is, beloved, to that, what can you call it, other than a heart-melting doctrine of justification that we turn this morning I hope, beloved, that we stand before this doctrine with total wonder. As I prepared this message, that was the case for me. There's nothing like justification. How amazing. It is central. It is basic to all the benefits that we have in Jesus Christ. So let's stand for a few moments in wonder before what God in Christ has done for us. Righteous, that's our theme. Let's consider in the first place before God, second, in Christ, and then third, by faith, alone. Before God, in Christ, and by faith, alone. We're dealing obviously in Lord's Day 23 with the doctrine of justification, the fact that we are righteous before God. Justification involves three things, so you can track these three things with me. First of all, justification involves a judge, a judge. We're not talking here about An earthly judge with flowing white hair, dressed in black, with a stern-looking face, sitting at the judgment seat with a gavel at hand inside a courthouse. We're not talking here about someone from the Supreme Court of the United States as intimidating and as bright as such a judge might be. We're not even going back to the brightest legal and most capable minds in history from the best of the empires of the world. It's not that kind of judge. But God himself, before whom even the most capable of judges are like straw and stubble. If you look at Psalm 143, 
clearly the Lord or Jehovah is the one that the psalmist is talking about who is the judge. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications, in thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness, and enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no living man living be justified. We'll get later to what that means. But just for now, the Lord is the one who is the judge. He is so powerful. He's able to execute judgment. There's no one that's going to stop him or resist this execution of judgment. And once he gives a verdict, there's no court of appeal. There's no reversing it. It's final. It's complete. It's there. Irreversible judgment. He's mighty. He's a judge that sees all. Not just the things that I say with my mouth, does he hear, and the things that I do with my hands, and the places that I go with my feet, and the words that I speak with my mouth, all those things he hears and sees. But this judge, with his gazing, examining eyes, can go right into the inmost recesses of your being to see the thoughts and motivations and the inclinations creeping around there in the hidden corridors. He sees every single thing so that it's like we go through an x-ray machine and he sees right there in the middle of it all. Nothing. Not one sin is hidden from his gaze. This judge is holy. I think it's generally true of Christianity today that people don't know who God is. Then let's not get so puffed up for ourselves because we often lose sight of who God is too. Our God is not a permissive grandfather that sort of has his grandchildren on his lap and they do something naughty and, well, maybe slips them a piece of candy, winks at them, and smiles a little bit. God is not like a man who sees someone else sin and he just sort of laughs it off or shrugs it off, not knowing really what to do. It's sort of awkward. I don't really want to confront this and it's not worth pursuing. God's not indulgent like that at all. He's holy. This is the God who opened up the earth to swallow up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram because of the wickedness that they perpetrated against God, and he closed the earth again. This is the God who took those two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, he rained fire and brimstone down upon them, not overthrowing the cities and all of the plain and the vegetation, but also destroying all the inhabitants of those cities. Our God is holy. He is pure. He is without sin. And He is full of wrath. Full of wrath toward anything that's unholy. Besides being mighty and eyes like an x-ray machine and holy, this judge is also just. Just. He's not going to look the other way and ignore sin. Neither is he going to be merciful at the expense of his justice, as if God can somehow, well, I'm going to be merciful to these people, and I'm just going to set aside my justice for now, where I'm going to override my justice. That's not the way that he works either. doesn't do that. He's not crooked. He's not corrupt. And whenever he makes a judgment, he's 
always going to do it according to a standard. What is God's standard? It's himself. His own pure, sinless being. That's the measuring stick, which is perfectly straight, according to which God makes his judgments. And he reveals who he is, that measuring stick, in his law, as we heard that this morning. His perfect law. God is always going to judge according to that perfect standard, and he has to punish sin. He cannot do anything else. Justification involves a judge. Secondly, this whole matter of justification involves the fact that you and I are guilty sinners. Guilt is liability to punishment. When someone's guilty, that means that they are worthy of being punished. So here are you, here am I, we're conceived and born in sin, the sinful nature our whole life long, and we're guilty for that very sinful nature. We're worthy to be punished for it. Then out of that sinful nature come all of these sins, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every single day, every hour of the day, more and more sins out of this sinful nature. And for every single one of those, we are guilty too, worthy of being punished, liability to punishment. Every thought that's sinful, every word that's wrong, every deed that's evil is a sin against God's commandments. We're guilty for it. I realize that's not a pretty picture. I realize that's not fun to hear. Not for me. But it's a true picture. And it's the scriptural one. Romans 9. Romans 3, rather, does not give a feel-good message, but a very sobering and real picture of things. Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. And then verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the picture of what we are. Hyper Catechism brings in this whole matter of the conscience and I want to bring that in, in this connection. It says, Though my conscience accuse me that I have grossly transgressed all the commandments of God and kept none of them, and am still inclined to all evil. You have a conscience inside of you. You might have wondered, what's your conscience? It's God's testimony through his word to your mind. God's testimony through the scriptures to your mind. And every single word you say, every single thought you think, every single deed you perform, there's always this testimony of God through the scripture to your mind. And what does our conscience do? When we've got those sinful words and thoughts and deeds, our conscience accuses us. As it says here, I have grossly transgressed all the commandments of God and kept none of them. And what's even more, I'm still inclined to all evil. That's what your conscience accuses of. Is that your experience? Is that your your personal experience really every single day that your sins rise up before you like that? And you know that your conscience, when it accuses you of that, 
And when the Heidelberg Catechism puts these words on your lips, it's true. There's nothing false about that. Now, combine both of these two matters regarding justification we brought in. Here you are before the judge who is holy and just, who is examining eyes or searching every nook and cranny of your very heart and soul and mind. Nothing is hidden before him. And he's just. He's not going to turn away from sin. He has to punishment. And the standard is himself. He must, he will punish sin. And he is extremely wrathful with it. But here you are. As naked before him. Your conscience is accusing you. All the time. You know what you are. You're a guilty sinner. You are that in Adam. You add to your guilt every single day. And you ask, what will the sentence be? What is this judge going to say? That brings us to the third thing that justification involves. There is a sentence that this judge gives. A verdict, a declaration from the bench, unmistakably, clearly, and loudly uttered deep inside you. As you stand before the judge, what is it? He declares, innocent. And you say, did I hear that right? And then you say, yes, I did. Innocent. Righteous. Before this holy judge, this just judge of heaven and earth whose eyes can peer into the deepest part of what I am, he has declared me, he has given the verdict that I am righteous. And then, even as the catechism says, for me, one who is justified, it's as if I never had had nor committed any sin. It's as if for me that I had fully accomplished all obedience. Do you see, beloved? The wonder, the, the absolute wonder and the marvel and the amazing nature of what justification really is so that you reel back, you stagger at it. You say, what a thing that the judge of heaven and earth has declared me, me, to be righteous. Now you can see, when we talk about justification, you really have come to the very center of the gospel, the very heart of what the good news is. It's such a treasure. And that he delivers the verdict that I am innocent. Well, there's comfort. Like nothing else is going to comfort me. There is such peace in life and death, such joy. Justification. But you say, there seems to be a problem here. There seems to be. Because it appears that God is no longer holy anymore. Whatever happened to that? Spotless, sinless God? Well, if He's holy and He is, then what happened to that? Because He just declared me to be innocent. And I know that I'm a guilty sinner. And I thought you said that God is 
just and he has this measuring stick of his own being and he's not going to deviate from that standard and he has to punish sin. So what happened to all of that? You remember Lord's Day 4? Sets these truths out too. Starting with question answer 10. Will God suffer such disobedience and rebellion to go unpunished? By no means, but is terribly displeased with our original as well as actual sins and will punish them in his just judgment temporally and eternally as he hath declared, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Is not God then also merciful? God is indeed merciful, but also just. Therefore, his justice requires that sin, which is committed against the most high majesty of God, be also punished with extreme, that is, with everlasting punishment of body and soul. And you say, well, what happened to that? Are we just doing a complete 180 here when we get to this Lord's Day and we're really not paying attention to Lord's Day 4 anymore? The fact is, there has to be an unshakable, firm, unchanging foundation or basis for God to declare you righteous. And beloved, that sure foundation and firm basis is Jesus Christ. His suffering, His obedience. So when you and I said just a moment ago, there seems to be a problem here because I'm a guilty sinner and He declared me to be innocent, there's no problem after all. God does, as the just and holy God, have a basis to declare us righteous, and that's Christ. When we say that Jesus, His obedience and His suffering, His doing, His works are the basis for God to declare us righteous, we always have to remember what the basis is not and what the basis for justification cannot be. You and me, our works, our law keeping could never be the basis for justification. We're going to talk about faith later in the third point. Even your faith cannot be in one bit the basis for your righteousness or innocence before God. When it comes to the things I do and my good works and my obedience to the law of God and who I am, that is not a part of our righteousness before God. If I may just put it as plainly as possible, God does not look at you and say, well, that's a pretty decent person. They did a good work here. They did a good thing here and a good deed over here. And because of that, I'm going to declare them righteous. He does not do that. We have to obliterate that sort of mindset from our thinking. We can so quickly race to other movements and teachings. We're going to do that in a second. But we have to deal with ourselves because I have a Pharisee in me. Because I have a pretty proud, sinful nature that always wants, just even if it's a sigh or one work or one thing, to contribute something to my salvation. If I can have something that makes up my righteousness before God that I've done, that appeals so much to our pride. So we have to deal with our own thinking. And we have to remember, nothing I am or do contributes to that righteousness or makes me acceptable with God. But there are movements, there are teachings, they've been around for many years, they're also 
present today that tried to take, let's say, this category over here, works, and drag works over here into this category, which is called justification. Righteousness before God. Taking those works and dragging them back like that. And when you confront that, when you see that sort of error, let's consider that to be the grievous heresy that it is. This is no small thing. When faith is a part of our righteousness before God or works are a part of that, that's no small thing because that is such an offense to God. He's accomplished all of salvation. It's such a wonder. But now I'm going to say, or these teachings are going to say, what I've done is part of it. That's a slap right in the face of God. And when you think about it, what Jesus has done, He's done it all. His works, as we're going to come to that, His works, His obedience, His suffering. But now I'm going to say, well, Jesus, I have something to add here. Well, that's dishonoring to Him. But let's bring it down to a practical level. If something I am or do makes me acceptable to God, Am I ever going to go to sleep at night? That's the robe that covers me? Part of what I've done? That's terrifying. Terrifying. Psalm 143, I bring in, in this connection, Psalm 143, the psalmist says in verse 2, And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. You see, the psalmist is not saying, I don't want to be judged at all. He's not saying that. He knows that God is the judge and that he has to carry out judgment. So that's not his concern. But what the psalmist is pleading for is this that God would not judge him in such a way that his works, the psalmist's works, are the basis of God's judgments, or that the psalmist's works are part of that required righteousness. He says, Lord, don't judge me in that way that what I've done is a part of this righteousness or the basis for thy verdict. Because if that would be the case, no man living would be justified. So serious is the matter that Belgic Confession Article 23 picks up on this and in fact quotes Psalm 143 verse 2. And it says this, And verily, if we should appear before God relying on ourselves or on any other creature, though ever so little, we should, alas, be consumed. And therefore, everyone must pray with David, O Lord, enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Over against all of those errors, we say, we are righteous in Christ alone. You have to understand here, beloved, what Jesus Christ has done. Two things. Number one, he has satisfied for our sins. And you read that word in Lord's Day 23 as well. He's satisfied or he's done enough with respect to our sins. We already established that God is just. He requires punishment of sin. But what he did is this. God imputed your sin to Christ. Let me put that a different way. God accounted your sins 
to Jesus' record. And God then having accounted your sin to Christ's record, who himself personally had no sin, who himself was personally righteous, but when God took your sin and imputed it to Christ, then the fiery wrath of God came down upon Christ who carried your sin in your place. And that burning, fiery anger of God came down upon Christ, especially at the cross. When God rained down his wrath upon Christ, he was just in doing so because your sin was accounted to Christ's record. That's the first thing. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. He came under the wrath of God. The second thing that Christ did was he obeyed the law in our place. Now this is something that we don't always remember or we don't always talk about like we should. We're quick to say Jesus paid the penalty for sin. He came under the wrath and anger of God and that's right and true. We just heard that. But what we sometimes forget is the other aspect of Jesus' work. He also obeyed the law of God, and he did that perfectly. So that in his heart and soul and mind and strength, with all that he was, he always did the will of his heavenly Father without any spot or wrinkle. Everything he did was in harmony with God's law. Sometimes we call that the obedience or the holiness of Christ. Those two things. He suffered under the wrath of God and payment for sin and secondly obeyed the law of God without spot. Now you understand. Those two things are God's requirements in His justice. And those two requirements, Christ did completely in our place and in the place of all the elect. I could not ever and I would not ever fulfill those requirements of God. But God saw to it in His great love that He would send His only begotten Son into the flesh to fulfill those two requirements for me. That's the wonder of it. He saw to it that He would do it. That's love. And that's grace. Then you know what God does? He takes that righteousness of Jesus Christ in his life and at his cross. Catechism uses those words, and I just used them a few moments ago. His satisfaction, holiness, righteousness. God takes that righteousness, holiness, and satisfaction of Christ, and he imputes it to you. Or, to put it differently, he accounts to your record that righteousness of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we call that righteousness that God imputes to us an alien righteousness. And children, when we use that word alien, we're not talking about those little green things that cartoon show come in a flying saucer from outer space. But when we talk about an alien righteousness, we simply are saying, here is a righteousness that is outside of us. In fact, it's outside of this whole world. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It doesn't have its origin in me. It doesn't come from me. It comes from Him. Alien righteousness is imputed to us. Sometimes we speak of a 
double imputation, therefore. And now you understand what that means. Our sins imputed to Christ and His righteousness imputed to us. That, beloved, is the gospel of grace. Glorious, marvelous, humbling doctrine, and there's really nothing like it. So we joyfully hear the scriptures when they speak of these things. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, referring to Christ, of course, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And then, again, Galatians 2, verse 16, which says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Then one other, the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, by faith. If you were paying careful attention to those last two verses that I read, you'll hear another truth in this whole matter of justification. You're justified, you're righteous before God, in Christ, and by faith, and by faith alone. Faith is a gift of God. Whenever you talk about faith, that's really the starting point. God's gift to us, all of His grace. It's been purchased with blood, the blood of Calvary. And now we're going to do a little speed review of Lord's Day 7 on faith. Faith is knowledge. Knowing Jesus Christ. And faith is confidence or trusting in Jesus Christ. Knowledge and confidence. The Heidelberg Catechism in a very beautiful way, speaks of faith, that activity of faith, in this way. It says, toward the end of answer 60, even so as if I never had had nor committed any sin, yea, as if I had fully accomplished all that obedience which Christ has accomplished for me, inasmuch as I embrace such benefit with a believing heart, speaks of faith as this activity of embracing. Then again, at the end of answer 61, it talks about that activity of faith, and it uses these words, I cannot receive and apply the same to myself any other way than by faith only. That righteousness and satisfaction of Christ says here, I cannot receive and apply that to myself any other way than by faith only. We often use the language, we're justified by faith alone. That word by is a means. That word means means. Faith is the only means by which we are justified and there is no other means, which is why we often say with the reformers of old, by faith alone. 
We have to be careful here. Faith itself is not what makes us acceptable to God. Which is why answer 61 says, not that I am acceptable to God on account of the worthiness of my faith. Then if you go back to the Belgic Confession, Article 22, it makes that same basic point when it says, therefore we justly say with Paul that we are justified by faith alone or by faith without works. However, to speak more clearly, we do not mean that faith itself justifies us, for it is only an instrument with which we embrace Christ, our righteousness. And it goes on. So faith itself is not what makes us acceptable to God. And here's another point that we have to be careful about. Faith never makes a big deal of itself. This whole matter of knowledge and confidence, faith doesn't focus on itself as if that's the thing. Faith doesn't put the focus on you either. It's not as if faith looks inside at who you are and who, what you have done in your deeds. The very nature of faith is that it looks out away from me, away from my works, and away from itself. And it looks to Christ alone. His deeds, His doings, His works, His obedience, His suffering. Faith looks to Him. Which gives me opportunity now to say to you and to me, look to Him this morning. Believe on Him. See His righteousness and obedience. And trust in Him alone. Beloved, Lord's Day 23 speaks to what we experience every single day. I know with a knowledge of heart and mind that I'm righteous in Christ and an heir of eternal life. Here I am in my sin and guilt again this day, Sunday, but I know Christ and I trust that I'm righteous in Christ and an heir of eternal life. God, even in the preaching of the gospel, has declared that to me this Sunday morning. The judge of heaven and earth has declared that. And by faith, I believe it for myself. Today, that's comfort in life and in death. I'm right with God and have a right to eternal life. What joy is ours? The joy of knowing we're clothed in white, pristine, unchanging robes. And that in pure grace... And what peace we enjoy. Rivers, floods of peace for the soul. So that you as a believer can say, come what may, billows and winds of this life, even death. I am righteous before God in Christ by faith alone, and all is well, all is well, hallelujah, amen. Father, that's where we end with hallelujah, for all praise goes to thee, what a wonder is justification. Thanks, Lord, for this tremendous benefit. Give to us that peace, that joy, that comfort that can only be found in Christ. And hear us in his name alone. Amen.